Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're welcome. Oh, cool. Welcome, I'm Joe. Welcome. I, don't, I don't know if we met in the lobby. Joe Allen. Yes. Okay. Anthony. Great nice to meet you. Anthony is right now. Okay. Welcome all to the Black Week endorsement interview. Um, we don't run this as a debate necessarily. We don't guarantee everyone equal time. This is just our opportunity to ask you guys questions and figure out who we want to endorse. Um, so we want to start this off by giving each of you a few minutes to tell us a little bit about yourself and why you are running. Um, so Joe, we'll start with you down on that end. Uh, Joe Allen, running for City Council, District 1. I think we all know that. Um, I'm a woodworker by trade. Uh, I've been doing that for 10, 12 years. Uh, before that, I worked in art museums as an art installer and construction kind of guy. Um, also painted houses. And I, I have a manufacturing background. Uh, recently, the company that I worked for kind of pivoted and took me from working in woodworking to I'm now assembling the uh, Safe Rest Villages. Hmm. So we assemble them on site and then uh, I've also been delivering them uh, personally, driving the truck, putting them on site and then running maintenance, going out and working in the field. Uh, Real quick, do you work for the company that, that manufactures the, the yes, pods? What's I do. the company called? I don't know in this capacity if I want to, I don't know if they would want me to I think I've say known it. it before. I think I've written about it before. It's just I don't think it's a big deal in saying it's, it's I don't lit. Think so. It's called yeah. Lit Workshop and it's actually okay. just down the street here. Okay. It's in the Northwest industrial area. Okay. Um, yeah, so, you know, they put me in the field working with um, the same rest villages, seeing the, the conduction, the, the operations there, and then it kind of inspired me with the election coming up and it being such a big change of an election it kind of inspired me to get involved and then uh, uh, just another part of my background this summer the reason I, I, I was a very late joiner to the race and the, one of the reasons for that was is I had a, a pretty major surgery this summer and I had to wait for that to pass see how my recovery would go now that I'm recovering and recovering well from it I have the time to run so all these elements kind of came together and why, why are you running? Because I live in District 1, and yeah, every time I leave my house, I see issues that I want to apply myself to, and it's like we, we, have, to get, we have to get change occurring faster. Uh, I don't see any representation on our side of town, and it's just, it's just a constant frustration, and it's like, like I said, it, the timing came together where it's like, I can, there's, here's a possibility to apply myself to do it. What sort of civic involvement do you have? Like, have you sat on boards or advisory committees, anything like that? I am completely new to politics. Okay. Okay. No, no political background whatsoever. Well, her question was different. I mean, have you ever joined the school board or any civic engagement? You know, big cookies for uh, to raise money for your school district. We're not talking about politics as much as just community engagement. Um, Serve on any boards. I've never served any boards. I've never had any uh, formal capacity of holding any chair. Um, I've never really sought any kind of leadership roles. Um, I've been president in every community I've lived within. And it's like, uh, as a musician, performer, um, I used to do comedy. So it's like, there was a lot of like outreach and a lot of community and a lot of- Where did you grow up? I grew up in Southern California. Great. Thank you. All right, thank you. David, you want to go next? Yeah, David Lynn. I'm running for city council because a lot of our families are struggling and um, scared out in East Portland. Uh, we don't get the representation, which means we don't get the resources out in East Portland. And too many of the families that I go and talk to um, as in my involvement in the school board and the, and the neighborhood association is that people are afraid to go to the parks. People are afraid to go to the schools. Can, can you just give us a minute bio, please? Oh, I'll try to keep it to a minute. Um, <coughs> I grew up here in Portland. I grew up along 82nd Avenue. I was actually born in a little apartment just off 82nd Avenue. Uh, went to Vestal Elementary, Binsmead, Madison High School. Um, then went to PSU and uh, got degrees in specializing in Portland history and Portland politics. And then right after leaving school, I jumped right into uh, serving in the na uh, neighborhood association. Our first project was <coughs> trying to get some county surplus property turned over to a voluntary uh, library in Montevilla. And then that just led me into every position in the neighborhood. I was parks chair, outreach chair. I would write the blurbs for Southeast Examiner, um, go door to door with the newsletters and stuff. And especially after 2008, um, you know, and the, and the housing crash, we saw so much more contentiousness in the community. We saw incidents along the 205 bike path. We heard rising vigilanteism, um, a lot of things that were concerning. And I had struggled to convey the sense of urgency to my elected officials. 
um, at the time. Can I would go to town halls and stuff like that. Can you talk about your employment history? Yes, I have worked for the state of Oregon for over 15 years. I work in regulation. I work for the Speech Language Pathology and Audiology Board. Um, I worked with the All right, so slow down. So you're currently employed by the state of Oregon. Yes. And you work for the Speech? Speech Language Pathology and Audiology Licensing Board. And this is a board that licenses speech pathologists? Correct, yes. Gotcha. Um, we also do like legislative review every legislative session. It's my job to kind of look at bills and do the fiscal impact statements and submit those back to legislative fiscal office and a lot of bu a lot of budget work because it's a very small agency uh, so it's basically myself and an executive director and an investigator. And would you leave this job if you got elected to city council? Absolutely yeah um, I think I absolutely expect this to be a full-time job representing constituents mm -hmm. and doing constituent services and being out in the community. Um, I was a union steward for SEIU when I was working for the state or when I was in a different position for the state. Um, I volunteered and ran for the Centennial School Board and through that I serve on OSBA, uh, the School Board Association, Legislative Policy Committee. Um, I basically get my hands at any time that there's an opening and it's something that the community needs a voice for, I've stepped up into that position. Great. Thank you. And I'm currently the president of the Centennial Community Association. Thanks. Doug? Doug Clove, I'm, uh, I moved out here when I was four years old. Uh, my family moved from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, originally from Chicago. I grew up here and did all the schools. I went to Our Lady of Sorrows on 52nd and Woodstock, if you know that school. Mm -hmm. it's, this, it's still there, but it's not a parochial school anymore. And then I went on to Franklin High School, on to Mount Hood Community College, where I ran for office for the vice president of finance, where I, I won that. And uh, I wrote the student fee budget, which I, I really enjoyed doing. It was actually the only position that mattered in that whole Malibu Community College student government. And then I went on to Portland State, obtained my bachelor's degree in political science and social science. And then while at Portland State, landed a job as a meter reader with the Portland Water Bureau. Absolutely loved it. Um, and I've been with the Water Bureau for 26 years. In my time with the Water Bureau, I went from meter reader to meter reader two. Um, when the new Cayenta billing system came upon us, if you're aware of that, we had an open vision which went, which completely failed the billing system. Mm -hmm. And so I was part of the program to replace the one that failed. And for two and a half years, I worked downtown as a business systems analyst on that project, representing the field services and what we needed from that software. And so then I went back on, now I went back to working in the field and currently I'm an inspector with the Water Bureau and out in the field all day, every day. And I've been with the city for 26 years. And you're running? I am running because I absolutely love this city. I thought, grown up in the city, the city's done a lot for me. I grew up over in the Woodstock area where you could walk to Woodstock Park and play every weekday, every weekend. There was no issues with other kids, the whole thing. The city is really, I don't like where it's gone. Um, it's not the city I grew up with. And so I think it's time that I just, with this new form of government, I'm near the end of my career. Um, with the Water Bureau and so I figured you know what I'm gonna try to do something here and make a difference instead of all the same stuff that keeps going on we're going on the way of San Francisco and Seattle and we're not Oregon has always been different and that's what's really cool about Oregon so I'm running to really just kind of be a, a normal voice among a bunch of I, I believe out-of-touch elites in City Hall okay great thanks Hi, uh, I'm Noah Ernst. Uh, my history is I've gr grown up all over Western and Oregon and Western Washington. We moved around a, a great deal. My dad was in the plywood industry. He uh, did what all great Ernst do. You get in at the top and ride it all the way to the bottom. Uh, <laughs> so he, uh, mills would close and we would move. And so there was one period I went to four different schools in two years. And anyway, uh, we ended up in Snohomish, Washington. Uh, I went to Central Washington 
Boston University. I got degrees in fine art and philosophy, so I wasn't actually qualified to do anything. Uh, but I could talk a lot. And from there, my dad and I started a business in the wood products uh, industry. We did custom cutting of wood for a company in California that made fruit boxes out of it, which was kind of fun. We moved it to Eugene uh, because it was closer to our customers and because it was cheaper. And uh, about another year in, I realized that, oh wow, I love my dad very much. I could not be in business with him. And I decided to go to law school, which is, of course, a uh, trade school for liberal arts majors, which I was in spades. Practiced law for, graduated, passed the bar in 2000, practiced law actively until 2009. The what kind of law did you practice? I practiced civil litigation. And so I started at a fall, small firm in Eugene. Um, we rep a lot of, represented a lot of really mom and pop people in Southern Oregon. I did some fighting over easements through on dirt roads through woods and that kind of that kind of very simple basic stuff. I moved to Portland because I decided it was the city I wanted to be in. And got a job here. I did uh, discovery document analysis on huge patent litigation cases. And then the last firm I worked at, we predominantly represented contractors and developers. And I was in their construction defect litigation. Um, I'm sorry, can you name the law firms in Portland? I can. Clark was Sparkman. Uh -huh. And the other uh, firm was Jordan Schrader, which I now, now believe is Jordan Ramos. Right. And I got uh, let go at, in 2009 because, of course, 2008 happened. And if your contractors aren't building anything or your developers, there's no contract work on the front end, but then there's no litigation work on the back end. And I, that was what the uh, American Bar Association called the worst legal job market since the Great Depression. So I was unemployed for a year. A friend of mine worked at Radio Cab Company, and they said, you want to drive a cab while you're looking for a real job? And driving is absolutely a real job. I drove nights at Radio Cab for three years, and a superintendent position opened up. So I applied for that, and now I've, since for the last 10, 11 years, I've been a superintendent, and since I've maintained my bar um, license, I'm also an in-house counsel for them. I help them with, um, you know, external uh, external attorneys. And you're in-house counsel for? Radio Cab Company. Right, and you said you're a superintendent. Yes. For? Radio Cab Company. What does that mean? Superintendent is the person who, they're sort of the people who put out fires, but also manage the drivers to the extent that managing independent contractors. Gotcha. Is a thing. It's a. It's very much like herding cats, but it's also yeah. helping people go through the process of permitting both themselves and their vehicles. We have a lot of contracts with different school districts, different accounts around the city. Get some of those have compliance things that the drivers have to do. So I help them get through the jump over those uh, hurdles. Um, and then obviously uh, a cab company is going to have auto accidents. So I. I work with our outside counsel who's our auto accident counsel we have a union at radio cab so i do i'm part of the union negotiation team from the management side um and just general everyday contract review all that kind of stuff but it's probably 75 25 percent in in terms of just supervisory for the cab but you're currently a dues paying member of the oregon state bar i am currently in dues. yes great well, so why are you running i'm running because um I'm just frustrated. I'm frustrated with the direction the city is going. I'm frustrated with what I perceive as a lack of ability of our city to get things done. Um, I'm as or appalled, frankly, at the amount of money that we're spending, uh, especially on areas like homelessness and uh, housing, where we're not as, as, we're not seeming to achieve anything. I know that. Um, so, and then I, I I built up to running. I, is the way I would phrase it is Uber and Lyft came into Portland in I think 2018 and I was uh, part of what we call the Transportation Fairness Alliance. I was the spokesman. It was part of an organization of private for hire companies coming together to say hey we have to have fair balanced equal regulations for Uber and Lyft and the cab companies so there's an equal playing field. And I saw what happens when an entire industry is completely ignored by the people in City Hall. Um, we were actively excluded. The committee that was set up to determine how to let Uber and Lyft in uh, excluded everybody from prior for, for hire and everybody from the taxi industry. And Uber and Lyft ultimately got whatever they wanted. And I have spent the last eight years working with 
PBOT staff, working with commissioner staffs, working with commissioners, drafting, uh, drafting code provisions to try to get those some restoration of equality or fairness back in the code and have seen nothing happen. We no. literally, oh, I'm sorry. Can you give us the names of the city commissioners and or staff you have worked most closely with? It's been eight years. Uh, Chloe Daly and Marshall Runkle, we talked to all the time when she okay. was in charge, got so. nothing done. I've talked to, and then we would go around, you know, so I talked to, uh, Fish, I talked to, now I can't remember the name, English accent, Parks Fritz. Department. Amanda Fritz, we talked to her several times. We talked, I mean, we- yeah, That's we, fine, we, you're giving us enough names that we can oh. check and see what they say about what <laughs> we do. That's oh, fine. you don't wanna, <laughs> they <laughs> might not always see. say nice things because I'm very passionate about making, you know, our industry, the unfairness of what happened and making change. Um, but, in eight years, even when PBOT agreed with our code change and said we absolutely should do this, and even when the Private for Hire Advisory Committee approved the code change, we haven't got anything in front of City Council in eight years. And that's just impossible. That's not a way a city should be run. Why do you think that is? It's because... Who, benef the, who benefits from... Not it's, not, it's not about benefiting in, in a lot of cases. It's about... Um, Chloe Daly not caring about private fire transportation. She cared about homelessness. She cared about something else. And when you had commissioners in charge of bureaus, they could say, we don't care about that. We care about this. This bureau's going to sit here. And then Joanne Hardesty got put in charge of PBOT. And she literally said to the director of PBOT, don't call me. I will call you if I need anything. And so nothing got done okay. at all for four years. All right. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Can, can we ask? that you each identify the most important thing you would do if you were elected at City Hall and tell us how you do it. The most important, narrowing it down, uh, is a task. Because I, I see it's, it, there's so many, it's, it's all, it's Yeah, we're asking you to prioritize. I see that. Um, I would say, Defining the role going forward as it is a new position, understanding that um, it's a it's a so your most important role, your campaign platform is you are going to define the role of what it is to be a city commissioner. If if you're asking what my campaign priorities are, I would say public safety is the number one issue that I'm running on. Okay, so what's the number one thing you do for public safety? Uh, I would increase uh, support and funding, understanding, and outreach for uh, public street response and, and make that more of a, uh, a hardwired um, so facet of the police. Uh, public street itself. response is not getting enough funding right now in your mind? I don't think it's getting enough uh, funding and support. I don't, I don't think it's a, a robust enough system. I think it's underfunded and it's a, a fantastic idea. Thanks. Okay. David? And could I add one detail to my bio sure. from before? I, I went, uh, while working full time, I went back and got a master's degree in local government at okay. PSU. So related to the sure. to yeah. the position, um, how, how homelessness is the number one issue that we oh, when we talk to people, um, and we have been working not only with the new proposed TIF districts, mm -hmm. uh, but we've been advocating for a lot of the vacant lots that dot up and down Burnside, um, Stark, Division, uh, a lot of those uh, zombie houses, the a lot of abandoned commercial buildings. Mm -hmm. We really want to take the, the plan that the council and the Multnomah County are, are formulating with their targets of about 3,000 shelter beds, and we want to not only make that happen, but go beyond that so that we can start so getting... So your priority those. be to aggressively expand the number of shelter beds? Uh, in, in small, well-regulated, um, okay. What do you think is like the max number of beds you'd want in one facility? Do you think is appropriate? I think what I've read, uh, the studies are saying around, you know, no more than like 30 to 50. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Doug? Yeah, homelessness is the same thing for me and, and safety. I think it's all combined. I just want kids to be able to walk down the street and be safe. So period. What would be your first goal? What My first be? goal would be we need to add police officers, we need to add street response. We need to add shelters if needed, and we need to contact and anybody, any consortium or anybody that will come in, nonprofits and so forth, 
and look at getting people off of the street. I would also also look at look at auditing everybody we've been dealing with, every nonprofit. Things aren't changing, and we're spending a lot of money. I would think by this at this point, you could have bought everyone a house. So I would have those. I would start from scratch, and we need to bring in more stakeholders. We need to talk to the police. All this stuff has been done just as an, by advocates from the homeless side, and not from the. Uh, neighborhood side it's not i'm getting i get an email i'm sure some of these other candidates got i'm just i'm on the street every day people aren't they don't feel safe they'll say this is going on over here and here and here and they all think because i with the, i'm with the water bureau and i work for the city i have the secret number to come and get it cleaned up i don't and i see it every single day that's the issue i will take it on i'll take it on 100% of my time if I have to. It sounds like nobody wants to own it or you know, we're, we're out of the joint homeless thing with the county. The county's a joke in my opinion. And so yeah, I would dissolve that and start pathing our own new way. Something has to be done. And if people don't like it, tough. Some people, you can't make everybody happy. Okay. No, I think the first thing I would do was make sure that we have funding to expand the police uh, force and hire more officers. I know that we're currently short of the number of positions that we already have funded, but we're, if you look at a city for the size of Portland, the average number of, of police officers is between 16 and 20 for, per 10,000 of population, and we're at 12. And that's just not appropriate for a city of this size. We need uh, enough officers that we can reduce 911 call times. We need enough officers that we can respond appropriately. I had a person beat up outside my house with a baseball bat. Uh, my wife called the police. It was on our cameras. No one ever showed up because they had higher priority calls than assault with a deadly weapon. That has to stop. So that's my number one priority. The number two priority. When was that, by the way? About six months ago. You know, so that's crazy because we had our car stolen mm -hmm. um, in, Al in Alameda, mm -hmm. and they showed up right away. Which that makes me a little like. It, it depends on where you are. Yeah, no, and and monsters. what else is going on at that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. I just, I, and, think I mean, in the time that we lived in our house, we've had that happen. I had my car stolen. My wife had her catalytic converter stolen. Mm -hmm. We had homeless people decide that they were going to set up camp on my yard. You know, it's and getting a police response right now because of staffing is very hard. Of course, we've we've missed out on two or three years of any traffic enforcement, and you've seen you know traffic fatalities increase, traffic accidents increase. You see, you see uh, cars all over the road with expired tags. I mean, it, it it's all part of that. The second thing is is exactly what he said. We spent a ton of money, and we haven't gotten results. Recently, the city council passed a uh, and created a position of somebody who's going to sort of be the oversight of um, grants going out of the city. I think we need a similar position for a, a single place that's looking at every not-for-profit that we contract with as a city from every department, so that we can say we can under everybody can understand who they're contracting with, what the goal was, what the contract says, what the end results are supposed to be, so the city councilor can say. Who are we contracting with to do this particular work that's not getting done? And it doesn't matter if it comes from 15 different departments, there's one person you can go to who is overseeing all of that. And I think that would be incredibly important to accountability. Could you each share with us one person or institution that's endorsing your candidacy, just to give us a sense of the support you have in the community? No? I'm endorsed by the uh, Multnomah County Deputy Sheriff's Association, by Future Portland, by 12 for PDX. What's uh, 12 for PDX? 12 for PDX is a business uh, group that came together specifically for this election to try to choose candidates that they felt were rational. And, and who set it up? Who was behind it? Oh. Can I get back to you? Sure, and then the Future Portland, who's who's Future kind of Portland is, is a, a very nice lady named uh, Vicky, who's again last name escapes me, but um, and it's uh, it's a really grassroots what Vicky Payne. Payne yes, grassroots organization. They've come to they came together uh, about I think six or so years ago, and it, again it's the, a lot of these organizations are looking for people that they think are going to be rational and pragmatic. Gotcha. And, Thank you. Yeah. No endorsements which to me is a plus. I, I'm beholden to nobody. Um, it's funny, when I let my union know, which I've been a proud union member for 26 years, 
uh, I got a response from the president and he said, how's your fundraising going? I've never heard from them since. They've endorsed other candidates. I'm sorry, what you mean is that AFSCME? AFSCME 189. Yeah. And so Rob Martineau, who every time he needs a vote on something within the membership, he has no problem calling or texting me. But yeah, absolutely. And so that, that to me just shows where we're at with this endorsement thing. It's all an inside deal. I have no favors I have to hand out to anybody. I, I need to work for the people of East Portland. So you, uh, Sarah Silkey is another Portland Water Bureau employee, right? Yes. Running for city council and just, did she get um She did get me? endorsed. Okay, so why but did she get endorsed matching. instead of you? She got matching funds, I guess, and uh, otherwise I couldn't tell you. I think it's because she was able to raise the money. Um, it takes 250 donations yes. to qualify. Why do you think you didn't get that number? I don't like asking for money. I just don't. I when we first started this, I thought, okay, well, you know, I'll go on my Facebook and this time. Well, Facebook isn't around for the last 15 years, and I noticed that everybody I knew from high school and everybody, they're all gone. No one even lives in the city. And when I text friends of mine, and a lot of my friends have donated to me, um, they were like, why would you bother with this? Why would you do this with that's a shithole, all that stuff. All these people lived here. Hmm. And it's sick. And can, can I is the Water Bureau well run? Water Bureau's run excellent. It is. Which is why they, they, back when I was on that Kayana project, they were going to buy PGE, and then the city was going to buy PGE and combine them. They've always, because the Water Bureau's the jewel, they've always tried to mess with it or bring BES in underneath that umbrella, and it never works. And now they just started something called One Water. I have no idea what it is. It's bringing everybody together. Okay. But it's just screwing up our um, best. Quick, era. I actually have All a quick right. question about the water beer. And then we'll sorry, we'll move. Uh, Gabe Salmer was, was Gabe Salmer fired. Yeah. I, I've heard that water beer employees overwhelmingly are very upset by that. Yes. I don't really understand. Is that? Do you think that's a fair characterization? Absolutely. And any, I, I any idea why she was fired? Um. Minx Maps is an asshole. Okay. What do you want me to tell you? You know he's still your boss, right? <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah, that's the whole thing. After this whole thing's over, and I, look, it, no one's read my Twitter feed, but I posted on there right away that this is bullshit. And so, when I go back, you know what, what the hell, I'm, 20, I'm in 26 years, I'll do my last four years, I'm not worried about re retribution. Okay. Right. But I can say it. He, for him to do it the way he did, and she's got a lot of issues at home too that people don't know about. It was really a shitty thing to do. Okay. All right. Thanks, David. David. Yeah. Uh, well, I work with a lot of cross section of different uh, governments, so I have endorsements um, from Eddie Morales uh, in Gresham, mm -hmm. Vince Jones Dixon, mm -hmm. our commissioner, uh, new county commissioner. Mm -hmm. um, I am endorsed by my entire school board, um, mm -hmm. even though we don't always have unanimous votes, and I often am like the odd vote out sometimes. Um, I have all of their endorsements. Okay. Endorsements from David Douglas, uh, Stephanie Stevens. Thank you. And, yeah. Any unions? Uh, no. No unions. Okay. What about any current city council members? No, I didn't see okay. any. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Joe? Um, I have uh, no endorsements, no funding. Not only did I not have uh, enough time to get that going, um, I, I also would have chosen not to. I, I'd rather, I'd be very selective of endorsements or money I'd be accepting. Because I don't like to rep misrepresent what I'm, the job I'm trying to apply for. I'm curious, which city, and I'll, I have this question for all of you, which city, current member of city council, do you most align with policy-wise? No, I'll start with you. Um, let's see. For Renee Gonzalez, okay. basically. Right. I'm Thanks. Very with. Yep. Done. I saw that you had asked this question of other candidates. I, I can't say I'm with anybody. I think Carmen Rubio's way too progressive. I think Gonzalez comes off as just being a jerk. Um, Dan Ryan, I, I never see him. I don't know what he's doing. He just keeps running on his brother's death. And I don't know if he's still doing that again in his district. I'm sure he probably is. Um, and who, Mingus Maps, I, I already let you know what I thought yeah. of him. So okay. I, I can't, I can't put my- How about a past yeah, member? Yeah, Ted. Well, a past, you know who I like, Bud Clark. Gotcha. Uh, no you way. left off one member of city council, Ted Wheeler. What's your... Ted Wheeler, a guy who finally started doing things right after he said he wasn't re gonna run again. I don't know what these guys are scared of. Okay. I really don't. All right, thank you. Uh, David. 
It's a hard choice with the current city council. I would say Carmen Rubio, though. Thanks. What makes you say that? Except for the uh, because of. Oh. Okay, sorry. I have no. I've I've never gotten any parking tickets. <laughs> I've lived here my wow. whole life. Wow. Wow. Um, yeah, but I t took public transit most of my life, you know, down here to PSU and all that. Um, Carmen Rubia, uh, particularly because she's not Renee Gonzalez. Um, okay. I think he has been detrimental to Portland, and he is the exact opposite of what we need in terms of painting people, putting people in boxes of you're either pro this or you're anti this, or, you know, putting and trying to, you know, play on people's fear and, and divide people. Yep. Instead of trying to say there's like some practical solutions we can come together on. Gotcha. Joe? Uh, currently, Rene Gonzalez. I think he speaks with detail and um, he's the only person that's saying difficult things that not a lot of people want to hear. Okay. Um, but also, that's not a full endorsement. <laughs> Can I ask Noah a quick question? Yes. Um, what, so, when, what years do you drive a cab in the, at night? I drove from, oh, God, uh, probably. 10 to 13. 10 to 13. Yeah. So what did you, what, just quickly, what did you learn sort of about the city in those three years? Oh, it, it's, a, it's a great job. And what you learn, the number one thing that I took away from it is that 95% of people one on one are really nice and really friendly and really just want to chat and say hi. Um, that the other 5% are only in your cab for 15 minutes and you can put up with anybody for 15 minutes. Um, that it's an incredible, I mean, if you haven't driven around Portland at night during the summer, it's an incredibly beautiful city coming mm -hmm. over the Markham Bridge and looking mm -hmm. at the river and the lights. And, and so you learn that every neighborhood is, is a, it's just a great city. It's just a great city and it's filled with great people. Um, and, and only a few throw up in your cab. You know, there's a key if you have 10 seconds. I carried around those barf bags that you can get at the emergency room that have the plastic thing that holds open. And if someone gets in your cab and they look even remotely green, you pull one out, you hand it to them and say, you're going to carry this for the ride. <laughs> and they'll say, but I don't feel sick. I said, I don't care if you feel sick. If you don't use it, you just give it back to me. And I had one lady who said that, we went through that little exchange, and then she said, I'm not going to throw, and she couldn't fit in this sentence and throw. So <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. So, so it made you, I mean, that's a really unique perspective for mm -hmm. a city council candidate, I would say. Right. I think, you know, that's a job that really, you sort of see, it's, you know, well, it's a different it is. view it from is. the bird's eye view. Right, and, um, and it's, 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 it's just, it, it really is amazing that it doesn't matter where we come from or what our background is or how much money we have or anything, most people are just incredibly nice. <clears throat> and, how, and this last thing, how did you feel about going from being a lawyer, you know, at a firm to driving a cab? What was that transition like for you? Because um, this would be another transition. Well, the transition was actually easier than you would imagine. Um, I didn't particularly enjoy some aspects of the legal profession. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I I have I've I've done a lot of different jobs. I've pulled green chain at a lumber mill. I was a short order cook. I ran a business. I you know, and so I I really I don't look at jobs as status things necessarily. So going, you know, from being a lawyer to being a cab driver, cab drivers especially then. That is a res that's a profession. That's a that's a respectable industry, and those people are hardworking people mm -hmm. who are supporting families. And I never felt an ounce of shame as if I had come down in the world. I was I was going from one profession populated by professionals who know what they're doing to another profession populated by professionals who knew what they were doing. And one of the biggest shames of the TNC industries with Uber and Lyft and stuff to me is that they've taken that profession and turned it into amateur hour and you know and yeah I, I, I couldn't be prouder of having been a cab driver and, and <laughs> what I learned driving and, and the people I met and Great. and the people I continue to meet as a superintendent because it's one of the most diverse industries that exists. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Um, you want to move on to rapid fire? Yeah. Okay we got some rapid fire questions one word answers please and if you try to say a sentence I will cut you off. Mostly. Um, <laughs> we'll start with you, Noah. Do you think Portland Police needs fewer cops, more cops, or has the correct number now? More cops. Okay. More. 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 Okay. Did the Oregon legislature do the right thing by recriminalizing fentanyl, yes or no? Yes. 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 Okay. 
Uh, are you in support of Clinton Triangle, which is the city's first temporary alternative shelter site? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, do you support the city remaining in the joint office? Yes. No. Yes. Yes. Uh, based on your knowledge of City Hall, what is the one bureau or office you think is the most uh, in need of an audit? People audit. Okay. Transportation. Okay. Uh, civic life. Okay. Mm. Um, water. Water. Why do you say water? I'm curious. It's, it's a very bloated, it, it's, it's a huge budget. And I, I see it, there's a lot of, um, in trying to do research in the past few weeks and trying to figure out what it is I'm running for, mm -hmm. what it is I'm trying to represent, um, they have been the most difficult to track down details of what they do, how they do it, how you know, they carry it out, who is making the decisions. Do you it's, think that's fair? You're in. Absolutely. You're in. No? No. Everybody, I, I work for the Water Bureau. I'm out in the street every day. Everybody is always thanking me. We deliver the best drinking water in the entire world. There's bar none, and so. Yeah, but I don't think that's the point you're making. Yeah, I, I wouldn't critique anybody working with water. I mean, I, I think it's a very. Then what are, okay, that it, it's bloated. I, I don't see it, and I'm a. I'm well, just so what are, you, what are you basing that on? And, and just in looking at the different uh, bureaus in the city, uh, looking at the different um, facets of the city. It's, it's easier, it's not easy to find information of how the function and looking over like budgetary um, functions. But the Water Bureau to me has been very sorted. I, I don't have information that I can directly. Well, can you give us one bit of specific information? I mean, have you compared the Water Bureau budget to other cities its size and find out that it's too large? Comparing the Water Bureau budget to the Fire Bureau budget doesn't seem to me to be terribly instructive. I don't know why, I don't know that it's too large, but I don't know if it needs to be double the size of the uh, Police Bureau when we have such a great resource of water. We're spending more money than places like Denver and Idaho. That it, you mean the Water Bureau costs more or just our cost of water? Our cost of water. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, this is slightly different. Sorry, well, we can come back to it. Um, Slightly different flavor of the question I asked earlier about which city council member do you most align with? Which member of city council do you think has done the most for this city? No one will start with you. Policy wise. Um, like actual things rather than. No, I understand. Rhetoric. I understand. Uh, that's a really difficult question. I think. Uh, uh, I think Renee Gondalas has done a lot of things that I think are important. Um, I think that. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that, that's who I will go with. Okay. I, yeah, I mean, it's Matt Close. I, okay. I, like, I like him more. All right, thank you. Um, current? Um, I, I can't come up with something that I don't believe. I don't think any of them have done You don't think any of them have done a thing? Abs okay, well, um, no, no, I don't. Okay, all right. David? I might have a weird answer too because uh, I'd say Ted Wheeler failed so spectacularly that he made sure that this new charter reform passed mm -hmm. with a weak mayor system uh, <laughs> and that we're now going to have a powerful council that represents more of the city. So he succeeded by failure. Yeah. <laughs> that was essentially my answer. I think, I think Wheeler affected the most change was negative and positive. Okay. Um, uh, do you support the city's camping ban as it stands currently? Yes or no, Noah? Yes. Okay. Yes. Is this a one word? Yes. No. Okay. Yes. But I am curious what you, yeah, what would you change? Uh, because I don't know where these fantastical uh, shelter beds that they're talking about are. Um, if there are open beds, that must mean that they are not being filled with people who are, are on the waiting with, with the uh, wait on the waiting list so it's kind of like getting out ahead of yourself and it and it ties into this whole thing that a lot of candidates don't seem to want to talk about is like you're just fear mongering and you're telling people that you're going to solve the problem but we've been watching sweeps happen for the last 15 years we've watched them sweep people from one place of the city to another and so this is just kind of like window dressing this is trying to give people false hope that they're going to be able to get, that the police are going to get tough on homeless and they're going to get them off their corner. They're not. They're not going to get put in beds and they're going to be right back so out. So as a city councilor, how, how, do you, how do you solve that? Problem? Well, working productively on the, on the homeless plan and moving aggressively to get shelter beds 
uh, to the capacity because we've never had more shelter beds than we've had homeless. And that should be our goal. And we need to start treating some of these problems like they could get worse before they get better. So um, we, we saw the yeah. We have police force people in the shelters. Huh? Are you saying have police force people? In no, the I'm saying we have to work on the supply side far more than the enforcement side. Although that is a piece of it. Um, but we've seen just how promising that you're just going to get tough on the homeless has not worked, and it's wasted millions and millions of dollars as we just shuffle people around, destabilizing them, moving them lower on the ladder of you know transitioning back into stability, and even then making them sometimes even more mentally or you know emotionally unstable, which is then a public safety threat to everybody else. But the, the, the plan for supply side has been the plan since the 10-year plan in 2004, and we're 20 years into it. Like, it, something has to change. And the, the camping ban says, if we have beds, you have to use them. It doesn't say, we will beat you up if there's no bed available. Right, so nobody, but... Well, it's still a particularly ridiculous notion, though, when you're 3,000 beds short. We're more. So, and, and so, but we've, we've gone and we've opened a shelter, and then we closed the shelter. Our growth has not improved until just, you know, right, after post-COVID, we've been getting some more beds. And, we, and we're, so we're moving we have uh, three in a good the, direction. We have three times the number of homeless people on the streets since they implemented the 2004 10-year plan, plan, plan to end homelessness. That is failure. Saying we should continue to do exactly the same thing that was in that plan. That's not what we were saying. Failure. That's not what we're saying at all. It sounds but exactly what I'm saying, to me like what you're saying. I, I think what you are saying is that let's keep doing the same thing. The the, the constant sweeping of people, the constant destabilizing you know, of people. That's doing the same thing we've done right, for the last but fifteen the homeless, years. The homeless population makes up like less than one percent of the population in Portland. Those people who live on those streets, those people who own those houses, those people who own those businesses and work in those businesses also have an expectation that the city of Portland is going to look out for them. Right? It's not that our, we are spending huge amounts of money and we have spent huge amounts of money on homelessness for decades and have accomplished nothing. At the very least, we should be able to say to someone who lives in a city in the first world that you're not going to have someone camping in your lawn, right, against your wishes. And how are you going to do that then? Again, we're going to create designated camping areas. We're going to increase homeless or uh, increase homeless shelters. We're doing all the things that you're talking about. And what the camping ban says is, and you have to take them. And it's not an option to camp out in front of this guy's store and smoke fentanyl. You have an obligation to take the services if they're available. That's what the camping ban says. And that makes perfect sense to me. So do you think, is there anywhere you could improve the city's current strategy towards addressing homelessness? Well, I'm not sure I, we know what the, that's why I believe in this accountability. I'm not sure we know what the strategy of these different not-for-profits that we contract with is. I think what we have created is a huge amount of spending that we can't account for. And if you're telling me that $60,000 uh, or $60,000 per year per homeless person is getting $60,000 worth of results per year, I think that's insanity. Do you I think, think the city should move more of those services that it normally contracts through nonprofits in house? I think that's one option. I think another option, like I said, is ensuring accountability. What is the goal? If you come to me with a program and say, I am going to house 1,500 homeless people, then at the end of the period of time at which you said you would get to housing 1,500 homeless people, you better have housed 1,500 homeless people. I feel like we spend money with organizations and we get full employment for homeless advocates but we're clearly not getting homeless people off the streets. Thank you. Yeah. Um, quick question. Um, if you could serve alongside any other candidate in District 1, not necessarily just in this room, in the whole scene, who would you want to serve next to? Uh, Joe, let's start with you. Uh, Terrence Hayes. Okay. Thank you. Steph Roth. Steph Roth. Okay. Hayes is the way to go. Okay. Um, Lorena Smith and, and Terrence, actually. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, okay, we're going to end with our fun question. Um, what were you best known for in high school? Our best answer so far is one candidate said they were um, the only player on the varsity soccer team that never played a minute the entire season. 
So it's sort of a nepotism situation. Right, yeah. So something like you can be self-deprecating. We love self-deprecation. Uh, if you were voted like most like, likely to succeed, most, you know, biggest nerd. Or if you stole like a bunch of rental cars and had to crack up derby. Yeah. Like I did. No, I didn't, but I knew <laughs> a guy who did. What high school did you go to and what is the name of that guy? Because he sounds fun. Doug Eggers, <laughs> Summit High School, Colorado. It was the craziest thing I ever heard about. Uh, yeah, anyone? I wish I was there. What comes to mind? Or are you known for, Joe? Uh, well, I was known by uh, every every group. I was kind of like the every guy. It's like I, I had friends in, in every, you know, with the nerds and jocks and the, uh, you know, Got it. popular Great. crowd. Great. David? Um, I would say a quintessential team player. Madison High School doesn't exactly ever have a big football team, uh, so I found myself playing defensive line, <laughs> defensive end, um, and by my senior year, I was just backing up just about every single player. Mm. You know? Okay. Uh, Doug. I ran for student body president, and then I looked to change out my running mate, and so they wouldn't let me run anymore because I wasn't part of the you know, the class and all that stuff, the government class. So why why do you why do you want to change your running name? Because it was a dude who was kind of a dork and then I figured I'll just get a What's wrong with dorks? Well I figured I'd just get a popular girl to run with me. She said yes. And I think they were all a little bothered because I was gonna easily win. Because it was me and because I was running against two girls and two girls. It's this popularity contest, so I just gonna have fun with it, so right. they ask that. Got it. Uh, Noah. So, I went to a high school with three grades and 1,500 kids, and you, I was a little punk rock kid, and I was the only kid who walked around my high school in a black leather jacket with, this is the 80s, pegged pants, con black Converse All-Stars. What pants? Pegged. Where you, so you get you pants, know, you get pants that are young. slightly too long, yeah, you're too young, slightly too long, <laughs> You, you fold them over like this, and then you roll up the cuffs, oh. pegging them. And uh, they look great with Converse All-Stars, just so you know. Great shoe, used to be 20. My mom didn't wear them here. What bands are you into? Uh, no, so I was a kid at, we, did, we got out of the school functions. I mean, this is a longer answer, but we got out of school functions because we figured out that you couldn't force people to go to prep rallies. And so I would, there was a big, uh, bulletin board in the room they put us in, or not bulletin board, chalkboard in the room that they put us in, and so every time there was a pep rally, I would write in huge letters, sex pistols are God, on the, <laughs> on the, uh, on the, on the thing, and yeah, you know, obviously the Ramones, and then it's the 80s, the, day, the dead in Oakland are still genius, but if you were a teenager in the 80s and you were a little punk rock kid and you listened to the dead milkmen, not only did you think they were genius then, 40 years later, you still think they're genius. <laughs> because there's just something about that band that if it locks in when you're that age, mm. it's locked in forever. Just, so, there you go. I had a Dead Kennedys ad huh? in high school. <laughs> the Dead Kennedys? Yeah. All, I never liked Joe Biafra's voice. I just couldn't. All right. <laughs> All right. I love it.